joint statement regarding trade negotiations between Beijing and Washington indicates progress, compromise, and the alleviation of trade tensions among the world's two largest economies. China is willing to increase purchases of U.S. goods and services, which could bring opportunities for both sides. Furthermore, both sides agree to strive to create a fair, level playing field for competition. While speculation about these trade talks incur debate about who is the winner from these negotiations, what could be the influences of the joint statement for both sides? How do we evaluate current China-U.S. comprehensive economic ties, and what will China's further reforms and economic liberalism bring to discuss these issues and more. I'm very happy to have Mr. He Wei Wen, who is a senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, and Professor Paul Gillis from Guanghua School of Management with the Peking University. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. But before we get started, let's take a quick look at this. President Xi Jinping's special envoy, Vice Premier Liu, says measures being discussed would help both countries, boosting China's economy while reducing trade deficit. This round of talks has been pragmatic, fruitful, and efficient. We reached many agreements. We agreed on mainly two areas. One is trade, the other is structural issues. We resolved some of our misunderstandings from the past. These meetings will not just help bilateral economic and trade relations, but build overall ties. It's good for people in both countries. It's also sending a positive signal to the whole world. Liu says China has a large middle-income group and is fast becoming the world's largest market. The country has been working to increase imports to meet domestic demand and support high-quality development. He also says China will enhance trade cooperation with the U.S. in areas like energy, agriculture, healthcare, high-tech products, and finance. The strongest demand from both the Chinese side and the U.S. side is to stop the trade war and stop imposing more tariffs on each other's products. This time, both sides pledged to stop the trade war and develop good relations, be it in trade or in investment. I think this is a major demand from both countries. The world's second largest economy plans to increase imports from the U.S. and the rest of the world. The inaugural 2018 China International Import Expo in Shanghai in November is a major move. We are expanding our domestic market and increasing imports because we want to serve the needs of our people, our economy, and our growth. Expanding the domestic market and furthering opening up will help our reform and growth. Speeding up reform and growth by means of opening up is a very important national strategy. It worked for China for the past 40 years, and we will continue down that path. Exporting to China or making China buy more, one must make the Chinese consumers happy. If you are selling stuff the Chinese people are not interested in buying, no matter how hard you demand, it's just not going to work. Liu says any future disagreements on trade must be handled with caution and calmness. It's a good start. The world's two largest economies need to forge ahead to bridge differences and overcome every barrier. Welcome to Dialogue, gentlemen. Temporarily, a trade war has been narrowly averted between the two biggest economies. But what do you think of the clarity and ambiguity implied in this joint statement? I think the most important point for clarity in the joint statement is no trade wars and no tariffs. That means that we'll bring back the relations on the track of dialogue and managing differences through consultation instead of fighting trade wars. That's the most important one. And uh, also, one, another thing is quite clear, that China will step up its imports from the United States significantly. Uh, of course, there are many ambiguities uh, regarding the transfer of technology and uh, two-way investments, uh, how to handle them properly. The joint statement, Paul, was one step short of mentioning specifically the 200 billion U.S. dollars uh, trade deficit that the United States incurs. So what, what's going to happen next? What do you think of the end of the statement? Well, I, I think that is all kind of implied in how long it took for this statement to come out. 
you know, it was expected to come out right at the conclusion of the discussions, but it didn't. It took another day before they could finally agree on a joint statement to release. And I, and I think that's because there was an attempt to try to come up with specific things like the $200 billion, but they're just not realistic goals for either side. And so I think they were unable to agree on a lot of the details going forward. And where we're at now is they've really just agreed to continue to talk. A question for both of you. Why do you think it is an unrealistic goal for the United States to drastically reduce the 200 billion U.S. dollars? Paul, first. Well, I think in part, you know, Trump has is, is, uh, negotiated himself into a corner. He's not accustomed to negotiating in public as he's doing now. And uh, anything he does now to back down from some of the requests that he's made uh, look like he's giving in. Uh, to the Chinese, and I think he'll be very sensitive to that particular point. Uh, but the 200 billion, I think, upon examination, most everybody agrees it's unrealistic in the short term. Um, you simply, there aren't enough U.S. goods to export to China uh, to make that happen. Uh, take, for example, uh, Boeing is the biggest seller of, of products to China. And they have $16 billion worth of airplanes uh, that Boeing sells to China every year. But Boeing's total revenue is only $90 billion. And if Boeing sold everything it made to China, it wouldn't get to $200 billion. And it's not going to be able to do that. And what about the soybeans and beef and uh, oh, other yeah, services? Oh, that's, that's still <laughs> far less than that because the total American agricultural exports worldwide is about $80 billion per year, and China has taken one-fourth of it, $220 billion already. If we increased another $20 billion, that would be very difficult for the American farmers to do that. There's not enough farmland in America to oh, do no, that. No, agricultural <laughs> far, uh, products, and for China. Yeah, and to turn the billion means very little about it. Well, that. globalization and beneficiary of such process uh, 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 does not only just refer to China and the United States, the two biggest economies. The European Union would have to be watching out very closely as to what's going to happen and what will happen to them, for example, as a result of 200 yes. billion US dollars. Uh, Angela Merkel, the newly elected German Chancellor, is coming to China in a couple of days. Yes. What would be the major points? Or issues on her agenda with the President Xi Jinping. <laughs> In this context of the trade-off uh, or trade standoff between Washington and Beijing. Uh, I think uh, the German Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel's visit to China will further step, it, uh, step up the economic and trade relations between the two countries and between China and the European Union. And the both of us will support the free trade mechanism in the world. But does it mean, Paul, for example, Germany stands ready to align uh, with China in turning to the WTO for the dispute settlement uh, I th regarding I steel and aluminum? I think that's exactly what Angela Merkel will do when she arrives in China, is she will try to reinforce the use of the World Trade Organization and other international bodies uh, to mediate international trade. And that is not the direction that Donald Trump's team wants to go. What compromises has China made? I think first compromise... Because uh, uh, media in China, such as Global Times, would be very sensitive to this issue about whether this is a fair deal, whether yet again we have been imposed upon an unfair deal. I mean, that would easily take Chinese back to history and uh, bitter memories about history. I think the, uh, the joint statement is more or less balanced. Uh, we cannot say that China loses uh, because we have got the result that no tariffs. That means unilateral tariffs will be gone. And we will again bring back the relations on the WTO basis. That will be very good. And of course we have to, of course we should also deliver something. One thing out of the, the, all the major points is to increase step up imports from the United States. Although we can do that with other countries, still we step up imports from the U.S. That's a good step. It's good for the U.S. and also good for China. I think that that's what China is doing. And Paul, do you think, uh, what do you think of uh, reasons why President Trump comes under severe criticism from almost the bipartisan forces, the whole establishment, the force striking the deal with China? 
You know, I don't think he can win very easily in this situation because uh, I, the complaints that his base has is that uh, their economic situation is worse than it was before China entered WTO. And, and there's little question that many people were left behind uh, by globalization. Uh, now, what he has promised, he probably can't deliver, which is to bring America back to the point where it was once a manufacturing power and there were high-paying jobs for relatively low-educated people. That doesn't exist in the United States anymore. It won't exist there. It doesn't actually even exist in China. Those kinds of low-paying manufacturing jobs are disappearing in China uh, at, at the same time. Uh, they're being replaced by machines. Uh, so Trump's in a very awkward and very difficult position trying to meet the expectations of his base, which is that he was going to be tough on China and he was going to bring jobs and great opportunities and prosperity back to America. Do you think your president, Mr. Donald Trump, has been most embarrassed by the internal divisions between the delegates of the U.S. Uh, uh, negotiating team who came over and uh, Secretary Mnuchin and Mr. Navarro, for example, were at the two ends of the spectrum and they were fighting each other. Uh, so this has been a point of vulnerability on the American side, Paul. You know, I think one of the weaknesses of the Trump team is it doesn't really have any real good specialists on China and these kinds of issues. And Trump has surrounded himself with these people who are not particularly the best suited. By the way, uh, Navarra is accused of never ever coming to China, and yet he wrote the book Death by China. He was here two weeks ago. <laughs> well, that's a very wise reply. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, I think uh, Navarro is not widely viewed in the academic fields as being a China expert. Um, the, uh, he was apparently hired because Jared Kushner was told to go find a China expert, and he went to Amazon and found Navarro's book, Death by China, and said, this is the kind of guy we need. And that's how Navarro ended up on the team. Uh, Navarro now appears to be pushing for a much more hardline solution to dealing with China. And I think he's focusing more on technology, on trying to deprive China of access to American technology. Uh, but that uh, horse has already left the barn. And uh, I don't think you can put it back in again. Whereas Trump and Mnuchin are focused more on getting a deal, uh, opening up markets for American companies, and uh, to reducing the trade deficit. And uh, those are not really the key issues that uh, uh, Navarro was pushing for. What, what do you think of the eventual issue at the end of the day is what's going on called the trade imbalance uh, or uh, uh, um, negotiations about uh, how to balance trade? Or do you think this is a, eventually a matter of a zero-sum game, particularly with regard to made by China 2025? I think there are two separate issues. First is the trade imbalance. And trade imbalance is huge, although it's huge. It is an issue a long-standing issue between the two countries. But I don't think it is a problem because trade imbalance, we say that according to U.S. official data last year, the America imported $500 billion from China and exported $130 billion to China, so leaving a deficit of $370 billion on the U.S. side. But they forget that we got $500 billion currency, and they got $500 billion goods from China. They are balanced, equal, same value. What is the problem? So this is, uh, if we focus too much on the trade balance, then we'll leave all our efforts away from the real issues. So I think the real issue is to build a mutual trust in trade and investment to increase the benefits of the both peoples, so not to focus on trade balance. Of course, we can step up. We should step up imports from, the, from America, but we cannot target on 200 billion or any more than that. That will divert our efforts. How come that the United States runs a trade deficit with almost all economists, Paul? Uh, it's probably the stage of the economy. The U.S. is a rich economy. Um, it, uh, it has moved up the value chain to providing a, a, to a more service-based economy, a knowledge-based economy. And in that situation, it tends to import the goods that it needs uh, to be able to, uh, uh, to run and live. But what do you think of uh, 
a possible boycott by young Chinese who do not apply for education in the United States as a result of the visa restrictions. Uh, uh, it, it could be yet another manifestation of a Senator McCarthy that mm -hmm. uh, we still remember clearly in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So uh, do, do you think uh, it's European Union, uh, Canada, Australia uh, that will benefit from uh, the, uh, the, the haunting specter of a uh, Cold War? Uh, of course, they will benefit in the sense, in, to a certain extent, the Europeans and the Canadians, but uh, not fundamentally. And I think that the phenomena of some dangers of blocking Chinese young talents to America is only temporary, because uh, America, it will be good for America as well, and it will change sooner or later. And do you think uh, uh, presidents of American universities uh, will submit a letter of protest to their president, say, hey, no interference uh, with our uh, uh, student recruitment. Um, wh wh what's the relationship between uh, the academic uh, community and the White House? You know, the, the, in the focus on the transfer of technology from the United States to China, I think that there has not been as much focus on education as there probably should be. Uh, but, m you know, many young Chinese, uh, very talented Chinese, go to the U.S. and obtain PhDs where they become world-class experts in particular technologies, and then they come back in to China and share that, their knowledge uh, that's in their heads with anyone else. They're not stealing technology, they're just taking advantage of the U.S. education system, which provides uh, superior education mm -hmm. and transfers great technology. I would not be surprised if we were to advance towards a trade war that uh, you'll see further restrictions against Chinese studying at top PhD programs in, in science related areas. Therefore, a few minutes, minutes earlier, we when I referred to the issue of zero sum game. In fact, uh, uh, the uh, visa restrictions uh, or uh, current trade standoff are all directed at. Uh, the Chinese ambition or capability of uh, taking advantage of the digital leadership. I mean, that will be a real threat, quote unquote, to the United States and to its national security, according to Peter Navarro and uh, Mr. Lighthizer. I think there's a, a considerable concern in the United States about China's rise and uh, worried about China's potential threat to Americans' leading position in technology in the world. I think that's, uh, in a sense, is reasonable. What we should do is China has the right to develop its high-tech industries, and that's true. And also, at the same time, China should cooperate with the United States, especially with the multinational American corporation in China, to participate in Made in China 2025, make them also uh, growing and uh, they also are beneficial to this process and also China will say that we will abide by all the international uh, laws and regulations on the protection of intellectual property rights and that the two countries should dialogue, keep dialogue on these matters and settle really uh, specific issues. There have been allegations on the Chinese side, well they are politically incorrect they say, well, look, the current trade standoff may not necessarily something very bad for the Chinese economy, which, however, could seize this opportunity to restructure and reform its state-owned enterprises uh, to feel the bite and urgency of reform. Otherwise, I mean, there could be a sense of uh, complacency on the side of the SOE, which enjoys enormously the benefits and subsidies from uh, the banking industry from the policy incentives. Uh, that's indeed uh, uh, a curse for the non-public se segment, which finds it very difficult to have loans. So what do you think of uh, this dialectic, balanced way of thinking? Yes, I think the external pressures have played important roles in China's opening up for the past four decades, and it will continue to do that in the future. And the important thing is to analyze to find out what are the reasonable right pressures and uh, also China should in this way open up and uh, follow all the international rules and to award fair treatment to all the players no matter state owned, private or foreign companies in the China market and also especially in the growth of high tech industries 
in that sense, that will be helpful for China to open up to grow. Taking ZTE as an example, it's what we call the targeted killing, precisely with the help of law, because uh, there are dozens of pages concerning the alleged violation of laws uh, in the context of uh, the American-led embargo against uh, DPRK and Iran. And therefore, don't you think um, we should have more we should have had more legal experts on the Chinese side to look into this uh, uh, battle uh, the battle of ZTE uh, part of the current deal if it could be called a deal between the United States and China is uh, the aversion of a uh, punitive tariffs or policies against the ZTE a huge electronic giant yeah I, I think I think you're wrong calling the uh, allegations to be alleged because they pled guilty um, and uh, the, uh, the problem I, I think there is, I think they had good lawyers. I imagine they had the very best lawyers. Um, but they employed a Jewish lawyer, right? This is <laughs> a point of a controversy. <laughs> I, mean, I don't think I hired Trump's lawyer for that, but... Uh, they, I'm not criticizing uh, Jews. They are my friends, by yes. the way. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the problem there was that they did not take that particular U.S. provision seriously, and they got caught. And, and the, the idea is that Chinese companies do need to invest in compliance. They need to make certain that they're complying with all rules that they're subject to wherever they're doing business in the world. And uh, now the problem is with, with ZTE, if, you know, to simplify it to the simplest thing, is they, want, want, they sell mobile phones as one of their business. They do a lot of other things. Uh, but there's a, there's a U.S. rule that says you can't sell. Uh, mobile phones to I Iran and to North Korea. Well, where is North Korea and Iran going to get a mobile phone? They're, they're going to have to come to China to get it because all mobile phones are made in China pretty much. And there's no mobile phone that doesn't have American technology because the operating system for every mobile phone is either Google, Apple, or, uh, or Microsoft. There is no other provider out there. So they, it was, it, unless, by saying you cannot export mobile phones to North Korea and to, to Iran, it basically meant they couldn't have them. By the way, ZTE is not a case closed. I mean, it's not just a battle. It could be a war of attrition. Uh, look at the role played by the White House and the, and the D, I mean, the Capitol Hill. I mean, they play bad guy and good guy. Mm -hmm. uh, President Trump tweeted the message, well, uh, my Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, and I are working very hard to uh, put ZTE back into operation. Yet the lawmakers said, no, not yet. So what do you think of the entire different roles? Is it just a carefully arranged and choreographed uh, staged uh, drama? Uh, I don't think that's drama. It's, uh, I think that it's the a theater? President, yes, that Donald Trump is, was, uh, sincere, uh, was uh, serious. He really wanted to do something to put uh, ZTE out of the Paris. Uh, at least to continue his business. But uh, the congressmen, uh, not all the congressmen, many of the congressmen did not agree. This, what the point is, ZT has violated the American law, so you cannot give him such a, uh, a good treatment. I think Trump is learning the limits of his ability to negotiate deals, and I think that's very frustrating to him, that he doesn't have the ability to just do a deal like that. You mean he, is, uh, he looks more presidential than one year ago? Uh. <laughs> well, I think he's learning more how hard the job is. Indeed, it's no easy job. What do you think of uh, the American anger that uh, American, overseas, uh, American multinationals should not be coercively urged to uh, trade uh, high technology for market shares in China. I mean, this has been a flashpoint between yes. President Trump and the Chinese delegation. Oh, yes. Uh, there is uh, certainly such a problem. Uh, we have got... Is uh, it a problem or is it, is it something uh, typical of the Chinese negotiation? Uh, no. Th actually, there are some problems in this res respect. You see, if we read uh, the report by European Chamber of Uni uh, European Union Chamber of Commerce in China and the M China China and your CBC uh, reports, all the reports showed some problems, troubles of their members in technology in the China made in China 2025 uh, practices. Or they have problems, but they are not very serious or tremendous problems because, according to US CBC survey last year. Only 19% of their members responding to the survey said they had problem of te forced technology transfer. 
and out of the total 19 percent, 67 percent of the complaints were for the came from the Chinese enterprises, not the governments. So this is a specific issue that both governments could talk according to WTO relevant rules, and we can solve them. What do you think of this? Uh um, approach of uh, or a trade-off approach for both sides. I mean, this is a th this seems to be a, a coalition of the willing, right? It's uh, the spirit of a contract. Okay, I let you in, give you market shares, and you let me enjoy the technology. It's fair. It's a fair deal. It's a, it's not something coercively imposed on someone. When we look at the advantages of capitalism since perhaps the Enlightenment movement in the 18th century, one hallmarks concerning. The success of capitalism is the spirit of a contract. It's fair. You are willing, I'm willing. It's, it's deal done. Good. It, no one is the loser, okay? You are willing to sacrifice part of the uh, privilege or technology to come into my market. It's fair. So the, the, the point of confusion on the Chinese side is why China comes under severe criticism on this particular point, Paul. Well, the, uh, you know, I think when you look at technology transfers to China, I mean, there is criticism that joint ventures are forced to transfer technology in order to do business in China. And there probably have been some egregious situations like that. But most of the time, if you want to come here and make something, you, the, the contribution the U.S. company is making is they know how to make it. And there's a Chinese company that's providing capital and labor and plant facilities to be able to build it. Uh, now, once you, trans you bring that technology to China and use it, it isn't it's rarely stolen by the joint venture partner, but you can't unlearn what you see. Uh, similarly, when you send Chinese students to the U.S. for education, they learn what they can see. They learn, they learn how to do things. They can't unlearn that when they come back to China. And uh, so it's, uh, it's impossible. If you look at things like mobile phones, nobody in China knew how to make mobile phones until Motorola came here uh, to make mo mobile phones. Now, this is the only place where we know how to make mobile phones is in China. What's the difference? But what are the differences between innovation and the copy? I mean, China is said to be a very successful copycat. Um, you, you cannot say we always steal the... Uh, the, the uh, IPR. Uh, so, what do you think of the obsessive sense on the American side of uh, getting lost in their deals with China? Oh, I think we have to uh, see the problem in very concrete terms because we cannot say in general that China is uh, copying technology or China is inventing on its own. We should analyze how many pieces of technology are really invented in China mm -hmm. and uh, how many others are bought from others by paying the, the patent or the so on and so forth. And uh, what are the real numbers and the cases that they are really despite uh, the unprecedented infringer of copyright? We went, despite the unprecedented surge in our applications for patent rights and copyrights yes. in recent years, the brutal fact remains China has been seriously put to shame by our neighboring country of Japan in terms of uh, laureates of Nobel Prizes, particularly oh, yes. in the area of natural sciences. I mean, we have been ruthlessly put to shame by our Japanese uh, competitors. Uh, Why? We don't feel shame because uh, feel we, we shame. know that we are still at a lower development stage compared to the advanced countries. For instance, we say that Made in China 2025 is not the, does not mean that China will by then the world leading manufacturing power. It's only the minimum threshold Then by 2035 to 2050. Only by the year 2050 could China become a manufacturing power. So we still have a long way to go. In other words, by the year China celebrates its 100th anniversary of the founding, then China could be really transformed into a giant in the sense of being industrialized or digital leadership. But will China be given the time? Will China be slowed down deliberately by our strategic competitor, the United States? That's a big open question mark. Yeah. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>